All right, so this is uh, using Amazon's web services from Ruby. And, uh, you know, get the question, does it scale? Well, when I was thinking about that and, uh, you know, why you would use Amazon's web services uh, at all is to really help self solve scaling problems. Uh, you know, being able to, with their services, they handle uh, basically the problem of uh, being able to scale your applications. But with Ruby, you need to, you know, know the ability to... Um, how that works. So I th when I was thinking about that, I thought, you know, there's this I Love Lucy episode that basically, to me, uh, is a perfect example of needing to scale. And so I'm just going to play a couple minute clip of the, uh, the episode there. And it's the uh, Chocolate Factory episode. <laughs> department. Yes, ma'am. Now, the candy will pass by on this conveyor belt and continue into the next room where the girls will pack it. Now, your job is to take each piece of candy and wrap it in one of these papers and then put it back on the belt. You understand? Yes, sir. Yes, yes ma'am. Let her roll! <laughs> Wait here. Somebody's asleep at the switch. <laughs> what are you doing up here? I thought you were downstairs boxing chocolates. Oh, they kicked me out of there fast. Why? I kept pinching them to see what kind they were. <laughs> this is the fourth department I've been in. Oh, I didn't do so well either. No. All right, girls. Now, this is your last chance. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped... You're fired. Yes, ma'am. Let her roll. Well, this is easier. Yeah, we can handle this, okay? So clearly that's a question of does it scale? And uh, in that case, <laughs> it did not. But, uh, you know, oftentimes we don't have the opportunity to just eat all the chocolate, right? So we've got to be able to figure out how to handle this. And so Amazon Web Services can help us do that. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> oh, thanks. That was, that was it. <laughs> but it would have been useful to know beforehand. But uh, thank you. So uh, the Amazon Web Services that I wanted to talk about in particular are the uh, SQS Simple Queue Service, the EC2 Elastic Compute Cloud, the S3 Simple Storage Service, and the Simple DB. The two that I'm going to really kind of be showing the Ruby code for are the SQS and the EC2, mostly because the API is similar on, on accessing any of those services uh, with the particular Ruby code that I'm using. So 
Um, I'll be showing the uh, SQS and EC2. The uh, Ruby gems uh, that I'll be using are the uh, right AWS uh, Ruby gem for, from right scale. There's a lot of different Ruby libraries out there for communicating with Amazon's web services, uh, S3 libraries and SQS libraries and EC2 libraries. What I like about the right scale gems in particular are that they in the single gem support all of the different services I just mentioned with the uh, SQS, EC2, S3, and SimpleDB. So uh, in addition, it's a well-maintained library. They update it often. Amazon updates their web services, it seems like quarterly. So the uh, right scale guys seem to be on top of that and always release new updates for whatever new features are coming out. As well as they've got a, a robust HTTP library where Amazon uh, occasionally will throw you error conditions and things like that that you can retry and so their, their HTTP library will automatically retry that for you so that you don't have to have as much error handling in your code uh, to handle those types of instances. The other library I want to mention is uh, it's called Cato. It's an EC2 pool manager and it's uh, basically a, a port of the lifeguard Java library that I wrote. Uh, I didn't write the Java library, I wrote the Cato port of that and I'll be using that today. So using uh, the right scale gems, we're going to just uh, show the uh, right AWS SQS. So you just you know require your gems, and then um, the right scale gems can use because Amazon's web services communicate via XML. You uh, you have the ability to with the right scale gems uh, specify that it uses the uh, libxml library, and that speeds up performance quite a bit rather than. Uh, just using uh, RexML, which it'll default to if you don't have uh, libxml, libxml installed. So here we're just basically setting the parameters that uh, are required to connect to SQS. So Amazon gives you an access ID and an access key, and really those are the only two parameters that you need to specify if you're going to be communicating directly with uh, Amazon because it'll default to communicating with them. But optionally, you can specify the server the port and the protocol and that's really handy for doing local development where you may not want to talk directly to, uh, to Amazon or if you're doing a presentation like this uh, where I don't really want to be communicating with Amazon right now because you know the internet connection may not be working. So <laughs> SQS queuing. So to, uh, to create a queue or to get hold of an existing queue, you basically just call sqs.queue and whatever the name of your queue is. When you have uh, a reference to that queue, you basically just call push to put a message in the queue. And again, this is right scale specific. Other libraries may do that. In the most recent update to SQS, they changed the maximum message size from 256K to 8K. And so you don't really want to be using this for pushing large messages into the queue and, pu and pulling them out because it's not really designed for that. So typically what you'll do is you'll put in some sort of identifier that you can look up in the database or maybe a file name or something like that that you can look up on uh, S3 and, and get your additional information that you, would, that you could have put in the message. To uh, get the number of messages in your queue, uh, you just call queue.size and it'll give you basically an approximate number of messages in messages that are in their queue. The reason why it's approximate is because of the way that Amazon has their cluster set up that when you add messages to the queue and you call back out of it, it may not go onto the same servers in their cluster and so it's basically just an approximate size of what their best guess is to what your, uh, the number of messages you have in there. To get a message out of the queue, it's, you just call queue.receive and if there are no messages in the queue, it'll just return nil. Uh, if there's a message in the queue, obviously it'll, it'll return it sometimes. Uh, even if you put a message in the queue, because of, again, how the clustering on Amazon's uh, services work, you may not actually get that message right back out because the, uh, where you put it may not be exactly where it's pulling from when you call it receive. So it's just something to keep in mind that it's not always guaranteed that uh, you'll be receiving messages all the time even though you, you know you put one in there. So to access the, uh, what, what the message is, you just call body on it and that returns the body. To uh, delete the message out of the queue, you call delete. The messages by default, when you call receive on them, um, 
there's a visibility timeout that you can also specify where the message will not be visible to other receive calls until that timeout expires. So for instance, if you've got a process that calls receive on the message but then never deletes it, after that timeout expires, that message will now be visible again so that if you did call receive, that message could come back out again. So that's the um, queuing. Feel free to ask any questions at any time. <coughs> So using uh, the EC2 write scale gems is pretty much like using the uh, SQS gem. As you specify your access uh, ID, your access key, and optionally the server port and protocol. Uh, basically all the write scale gems to connect to the uh, Amazon services connect exactly like this. So whether you're doing S3, EC2, SQS, or simple DB. So it makes it, you know, the API is kind of really nice that way. So communicating uh, with the EC2 instances, if you're, if you're not familiar with EC2, they're basically virtual servers where uh, Amazon stores a copy of a machine instance that you can basically boot up as many of those copies as you want. And um, boot up time is on average around two minutes, uh, though I've seen it go quite a bit faster uh, recently. There are different size images uh, that you can boot up as far as the kinds of um, hardware, virtual hardware, if you will, that gives you more memory or more processors, and they charge you know accordingly. So to um, describe what kind of instances that you have booted up, you just call it EC2 describe instances, and it basically returns you a hash that is then other hashes of information regarding the uptime on the machine, what the IP addresses are, those sorts of things. To run an instance, uh, you basically call run instances, whatever the name of the Amazon machine image is, what the minimum number of instances you want and the maximum number of instances. Now you may not actually get the number of instances that you request, so it's a good thing to check to see, hey, I requested, you know, start up five instances, it may have only started up three. To terminate an instance, as part of that hash that you get with a describe instance or the run instance will also return the same, same type of information, you basically get an identifier that you can use to then later terminate those instances and it basically just takes an array to do that. So Cato, the pool manager, uh, basically uh, what I wanted to be able to do uh, in scaling an application is basically dynamically determine should I start an instance up or should I close one down if they're just sitting there idle. And so I did a lot of searching and stuff like that and tried some code on my own but ultimately I found a Java library called Lifeguard uh, with some pretty good documentation on um, you know, it, it basically solving that exact same problem. And so I basically ported that over to Ruby and um, that's what Kato the pool manager does is it basically looks at your queues, determines whether or not it should start up or stop um, instances and then it relies on the right scale gems for basically running those things that you just saw with the, uh, the queuing and the receiving messages and those sorts of things. So the, I'll talk about the config uh, just the next one. So you can manage multiple Queue, uh, multiple pools of EC2 instances. So uh, let's say you have a, you know, two different machine images. You have a machine image for your website or you have a machine image for uh, your database or some other kind of processing service, application service or things like that. You can use Cato to manage those multiple pools independently. So let's say your application servers are just getting hammered. Well, it can, it can manage starting those up while leaving your web servers, uh, you know, just running normal or vice versa. So you can specify the minimum number of instances you want running, the maximum number of instances. You can specify ramp up and ramp down intervals so that it can monitor the load. And if he sees that you're, you're getting just a huge amount of load in your queue, it can basically ramp that up a lot faster. And if it sees that you're just incrementally, uh, the load is increasing, it can, uh, do that a little bit slower so that it's not starting up so many instances. Same thing with, with shutting down. So if suddenly it just, your queue gets emptied, you know, all your processes uh, do, do all the work, 
basically it can, it can ramp down slowly or it can ramp down pretty quickly. Um, there's also, you can specify with Amazon, they charge you for the full hour of each service that you have, of each instance that you have running. So if you're only using that instance for you know, a couple minutes to do some processing, it doesn't really make sense to shut that instance down as soon as it's done processing because Amazon's just going to charge you for the full hour anyway. So you can specify what the minimum time that your instance is running. So probably I would think that you could set it at you know, 55 minutes or something like that um, unless you had a reason to set it shorter. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's definitely things that you have to consider in deploying to Amazon. It's not, uh, you know, this uh, utopian deployment environment where you know everything just is going to be rosy for you. You basically, um, you know, it's it's just not perfect, and so you have to account for these sorts of things if you're going to be using Amazon's web services. You ask for an instance, you may not get one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm not. I'm not sure, like real world kind of statistics on you know how often that happens. Uh, in my personal experience, um, not with EC2 but with SQS, I've had a lot of a lot of different issues uh, with working around those sorts of things. Where uh, you know I'll put a message in the queue. I know it's in the queue, but I call a receive message and I don't get anything back. But Ten minutes later, hey, there's my message. You know, so it's like I said, it's not perfect, but um, y you know, it's not totally horrible either. Cool. So I wanted to actually put together a, a sample application that actually demonstrates this and actually uses this, and not just uh, you know talk about what the code can do, but I actually wanted to show code actually running and, and working. And so I thought, you know, back to that I Love Lucy episode, I thought, hmm, you know, that's a really kind of cool way of illustrating, you know, the ability to need to scale. But the problem is, is you know, they couldn't just dynamically add and remove people as they needed. But with Ruby, we can. And I wanted to put a little bit of a Ruby twist on that. So rather than making chocolate, we can make chunky bacon. So I've got a little workflow here, a little flow chart of uh, the process of making bacon. So we start out with a slicing, uh, we call a package on a, on a slice of bacon. And basically what happens is it gets added to the database so that we have a record of that. And it also gets added to the chunky unpackaged queue. Now we have Cato, the ET2 pool manager, sitting over there off the side monitoring that chunky unpackaged queue. And we also have uh, the cartoon foxes there. Those are represent, each one of those represents our EC2 instances that are running. So what Cato does is it monitors the chunky unpackaged queue to see do we have any bacon in there and how much. And it looks into the chunky unpackaged status queue where the EC2 instances basically report am I busy or am I idle? You know, am I just, am I really doing something or if I'm just sitting here? And that way the pool manager can know, well, you know, hey, they're really busy and there's a lot of stuff in the queue, start up more. Or, you know, they're just sitting there idle, not doing anything, shut them down. Once the, uh, once the instance is started up, it starts pulling those messages from the queue and it starts packaging them up. Packaging them up. Once a, a slice of bacon has been packaged up, it gets put into the chunky packaged queue. Well, we have another process that's sitting there that's basically just doing nothing but pulling the slices out of the, out of the, uh, out of the packaged queue and just updating the database that, hey, this slice has been packaged. So we'll just take a look at that code, which again uses the, uh, the uh, right scale gems for that to kind of give an example of, um, you know, how this process is working. I basically just have a, a SQL model um, for this. And so it goes and it calls create, which creates the entry into the database. I get a reference to the ch chunky unpackaged queue. I push the ID of the slice that was created in the database onto the queue, and then I just return the slice. So the, the foxes, they sit there, and uh, while they have, you know, while packing, they basically attempt to pull a message out of the queue. They send that status update that I was talking about uh, that, hey, it's now busy doing something. 
And then basically all this does is it doesn't really do any work, but it basically just puts that message body back onto the, pa onto the packaged queue and then deletes that ori original message. So basically when we added the, the message to the queue, we just put the ID of the slice in there. And so basically the body it contains that ID and we just push that back onto the packaged queue. We send the status update that, hey, you know, I'm not busy doing anything anymore. And then it just waits a couple seconds. The uh, Fox Git package bacon basically does this kind of same sort of thing where it gets a reference to the uh, packaged queue, goes and it pulls a message out of that queue, also have it do a check to make sure it actually exists in the database in case it didn't for some reason, and then it just updates the package that time uh, with what it is, and then it just deletes the original message out of the queue. So, yeah. How often does the delete message? I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did, and so you should probably account for that in your code. Uh, I've had instances of uh, messages actually being delivered twice, and so that's very possible that uh, that you attempt because it gets delivered twice with the same message ID, and so your first pro first time it gets uh, out of there, it gets deleted. But in somewhere in Amazon's cluster, somehow a duplicate of that exact same message is floating around, and so if you attempt to to operate on that, it it basically fails. So yeah, again, you're, you know the question earlier about uh, uh, the question here was how often um, or is it possible uh, if the mes when you call message delete if uh, if that would generate an, it could generate an error, and yeah, it, it totally could. Good. All right. Cool. All right. So we've got our uh, chunky bacon application here, and it looks similar to the uh, chocolate factory that we had in the uh, uh, I Little Lucy episode. And uh, so we've got our cartoon foxes to help us out here and package up this bacon. And so each one of these foxes represents uh, an EC2 instance that's running. Now, because I mentioned before, it's not you know, it wouldn't have been wise to actually try to rely on really connecting to Amazon to do this. I've basically emulated EC2 and SQS locally here on my machine so that when I do API calls through the right scale gems, it's basically going to my emulated processes rather than going really out to, uh, to Amazon. So well, let's get some uh, letter roll, you know, yeah, letter roll and. <laughs> So we'll let her roll here. So uh, I'm just gonna loop uh, and slice some slice some bacon here. And so uh, let's see. Come on, here we go. So the bacon's going down the conveyor belt, right? And so it's it's being packaged up. Uh, as we can see, it's being transformed there. And we can let this go for a while, but I know that you know it'll probably be fine. So let's you know speed her up a bit. So let's go ahead and do that. So I basically just uh, doubled the speed on that uh, from, basically it was doing every three seconds it would go and do a slice and so now every one and a half seconds it's creating a slice. So that's, we can see that it's getting down the belt, you know, pretty good. But uh, the way that a half thing is configured, <laughs> uh, it, it considered the load to be enough to go ahead and start up an, another fox, which it did. And uh, so it's still going down pretty good. Hey, get another fox, all right. So uh, basically it's monitoring that queue that we're putting the slices into, the Cato process that I have. It's monitoring the queue and it's, it's saying uh, the instances are reporting whether they're, they're idle or busy. And um, the queue's taking that into account, or the uh, EC2 pool manager's taking that into account and starting and stopping foxes as needed. Because of this is, I'm pretty much trying to do this in real time, and your Amazon instances aren't going to start up in seconds. You know, it's going to take a couple minutes, so it's not exactly perfect here, but it works okay. So let's just, uh, you know, really kick this up. 
There we go. You can see that it's not actually getting to all the slices. As each slice goes down the conveyor belt, I'm basically doing an Ajax call to say, hey, give me the status. Oh, hey, there's Darth Vader and a sombrero. Right on. <laughs> right on. So as uh, each slice is coming down the, uh, the conveyor belt, it's doing an Ajax call every 1.x seconds or whatever. To, to say, hey, am I packaged yet? Am I packaged yet? Am I packaged yet? And uh, we don't have enough instances. I basically set the uh, the minimum instances at two, as as we saw when we started up the app. The two were there, and uh, it'll basically just cap it at six. So, are there uh, any questions at all? So I've got some time. <laughs> Yeah. The ceiling, sir, um, the question is a little bit of the, the value of why you use something like that, especially if you're not really sure if you receive what that is the next question. What would what, what you use that for? Do you have an example? Sure. Um, I have a service that I, um, that I have that basically processes continuous integrations uh, in an automated fashion. And so when somebody makes a commit to the repository, um, basically it records in the database that, hey, you know, I've got this new commit in there and it needs to run continuous integrations on there. So I can use Amazon's EC2 service and SQS service to basically go and fire up processes if I need to to go and run those builds. And so in my, in my particular case, I don't really care what the message order is. Um, or what order I receive the messages in because it's just not critical to the way the application works. And so for those types of things, it works fine. I'm sorry, to repeat the question, what, what was the, the uh, phrase it used? The application, but so is it is the benefit of the queuing service being at Amazon that you can um, run to start as many instances as you want and all access in queue? Okay, yeah, so what's the benefit of using Amazon's queue service as maybe opposed to just using your own queue on your own servers or something like that? And the, and the, um, the benefit that I found to that, because I was using my own queue, was that um, I can, uh, rather than managing my own queues and opening up my own ports and adding my own security and those sorts of things, I can just have Amazon basically manage that for me. And the service is so cheap that, you know, cost-wise, it... it doesn't really cost me a whole lot to do that, um, and I, you know, address the reliability kind of issue where, in my particular case, I don't really doesn't really matter all that much if the message doesn't come right away or doesn't come in order, and so basically using Amazon's queue services for that would be great. There's a lot of new queue things, uh, queue services kind of popping up that you can run on your own servers. And if they manage authentication and they manage uh, that sort of thing, then by all means, uh, that would definitely be a good benefit. But I just didn't want to kind of have to reinvent the will or the uh, will to do all that. Wouldn't SimpleDB be an option to that if you really care that you don't get it twice the same message and things like that? If you still be in the same cloud, right? Yeah. If you, you have logs, I don't know if you can do logs with well, the So the question was rather than using Amazon's uh, SQS service, uh, because you may not be guaranteed that the messages are going to come out in the order that you put them in, is could you use their simple DB service to do that? And so presumably you'd have you know a, some kind of key or identifier that um, you could get the messages out in the proper or the you know the data out in the proper order. And the answer to that is is that um, from what I've read and I haven't actually used Amazon Simple DB service is that it could potentially have the same problem where you put something in the database and it'll get there eventually but it's not guaranteed that the next time you have a call to that database that it's going to be there. So you could run into the same possibilities that you're running into SQS in that regard. Yeah. How do you pick out uh, from the problem spaces that might seem different? What sort of problem space is a, a good candidate for EC2 or, or 
you know, how do you how do you decide? Okay, this part of what I'm doing is something I should put on Amazon Web Services. Uh, the question is uh, basically, how do you decide? whether or not you're going to use Amazon's web services for either you know, your whole application or part of, parts of your application. Uh, for me, that was pretty simple uh, in the service that I built, is that rather than provisioning a whole bunch of servers uh, to basically be able to handle um, a seasonal kind of load, um, I could have done that. But rather than doing that, with I have parts of my application that aren't running on Amazon's web services and the parts that I need to be basically be able to dynamically scale uh, without having to go through a provisioning kind of process uh, on servers, that's, that's where Amazon really had uh, value there for me. And um, so I would say that you know, the ideal kind of use case or candidate is, is that sort of thing where you have an application where you need to basically uh, be able to scale up pretty quickly and if you need the ability to be able to scale up dynamically, even more so. Um, in a lot of cases, you could just manually fire up your instances, not have to worry about checking queues and, th and that sort of thing to determine uh, whether or not you needed more. Uh, but you, know, you can have a case where um, you know you're just going to get a couple, you know, a high load for a day or two or something, just start up some additional services to handle the load and then manually turn them off when you need to. So I would say that those kinds of uh, use cases where you basically need to be able to quickly bring up new instances uh, and, and or shut them down quickly would be, would be the use case for that. On the web services, and some just stay on regular services. Uh, well, no, I, I, I do that myself. Where I have part of my application running on not Amazon's web service, just a server at a colo, um, because I need it running full time, and it's not something that I need to um, right now to be able to scale at all, um, because it's basically just doing you know simple database queries and things like that. That I'm not really hitting any kind of scalability issues in that regard. But on the other hand, with um, being able to run continuous integrations builds, if a whole bunch of developers check in a whole bunch of code at once or in a very short amount of time, the static server that I have sitting there won't necessarily be able to process those continuous integrations in a timely manner. And so it would be a simple thing for me to just fire up some EC2 servers you know, for an hour and basically pr chunk through all those continuous integration builds and then turn them off you know, as, as it needs to. So yeah, part of my application runs on uh, just you know, static non-EC2 servers. And the other part, the part that I need to be able to scale, can run on EC2. Uh, EC2 just recently announced a day or two ago that uh, they're adding static IP addresses um, to your instance. So basically your account gets a, a reference to a static IP address that you can then assign to your instance. Because one of the big things about uh, EC2 before this was that it just gets some random IP address somewhere. And so people were wanting to run their, their entire application, everything on EC2, well, that's in, you know, when I go to www.whatever.com, how does it get to your EC2 instance? Because the instance is, gets uh, allocated a dynamic IP address. And so there are a lot of different workarounds for that and Dyn DNS and, and those sorts of things. Well, Amazon just recently announced that you can have a static IP address now so that when, uh, you, if you have an instance go down, which again, I'm not entirely sure how often that really happens. Uh, I would think, you know, Amazon says that basically your instance can go down if, you know, they have some kind of hardware failure or you manually shut it off. And those are pretty, pretty much the only two uh, kinds of situations that would cause your instance to go down. But should it go down, um, you could basically start up another instance and even start up another instance in maybe a different colo, uh, you know, their, their network operation center and basically start up another instance point your IP address to it, and um, basically it'll start using that, so. Any other questions? Yeah. Where do you keep your data? Where do you, uh, well in here I just, I just kept it in a MySQL database. Uh, do the nodes communicate with that single MySQL database? 
No, the, uh, the instances don't communicate at all to the application server or the database, uh, which is part of the reason why I, I chose to use the, uh, SQS for basically doing uh, um, in, in the service that I'm actually running for like the continuous integrations. Or, yeah, so what I did there is I mentioned um, earlier on the slides where you can only put you know so much data in as a message, and so you're pretty much going to be using like an identifier or or uh, you know, like a file name for um, S3. So in my particular instance, what I'll do is I will go and upload uh, the code to S3, get the file name for that, put the file name in SQS along with a couple additional pieces of information like what database to use for continuous integrations and, and that sort of thing. So the message is still really small. The instances have enough information to go and run the build. When it's done running the build, it will go and it will basically use part of that identifier from the first message, put that into basically a done queue, and will upload in a YAML file the results of the continuous integration build onto S3. Then I just have a, a process sitting on my, on my application server, on my non EC2 servers that just go and pull that queue, go grab the file out of. Uh, S3 to, to get the results and then update the, the database there. Yeah, you can basically S3 as a data transport for that. I, I could, um, getting the code uh, to the instances would still be S3, but I could use like simple DB if I wanted to to get the status of the build, you know, just store that in, in there. I, I probably could do that, but. Um, uh, unlike the uh, the SQS, the simple DB, I'm not entirely sure. It seems like there's a lot of different options that are starting to pop up out there that um, could basically do the same thing, maybe even better or easier. Couch DB, uh, we're going to have a talk on that. You could probably use that. Um, you know, there's the uh, stroke DB and and those sorts of things where rather than the simple DB, you could use sorts of those sorts of things because I think you know eventually it'll have authentication and those sorts of things so that you don't have to worry about setting that up. Like I said, with the uh, SQS, uh, if I wanted to spend the time to, you know, get authentication working so that my instances, regardless of where they're at, can communicate with my queue, then I'd probably go ahead and probably not use SQS anymore because, you know, it does have issues you have to account for when you're using it. Cool. Well, uh, so resources. You can actually get this application uh, on GitHub and it has all the code up there, uh, the entire thing. Um, I've em like I said, I've emulated uh, EC2 for this and so what that does is just basically a MERB app that responds to the API calls that the right scale gems use and um, basically uses God to load a config file for what my faux EC2 instance is and uh, does the processing that way. And then I've also got uh, another MERB application that uh, emulates the SQS queue. For this particular uh, use case, uh, because I needed things kind of real time, it's just, it's just hammering the heck out of the queue, uh, you know, doing multiple per second queue requests in kind of a real life situation uh, rather than this kind of contrived example, you wouldn't be hitting your queue so fast more than likely. And if you did, it's going to be kind of slow because it's, you know, having to do an HTTP request over the network to Amazon, you know, process that and get that back to you. And so that's not always a really performance critical kind of thing like I wanted to do here. So here I'm just monkey patching uh, the right scale SQS jam to basically just talk to a local database instead of talking over HTTP. But I did put the MERB app up there that does emulate the parts that the app could could have used if I didn't need it to be so performance critical. Well, thank you.